Well, Coronation Fund managers added another feather to their cap recently when they were named as the best Africa fund manager for 2012 at the Africa Investor Index Series Awards. The Coronation Africa proposition comprises the Coronation All Africa Fund and the Coronation Africa Frontiers Fund. Joining us from Cape Town to tell us what the Africa Frontiers Fund has been up to is Peter Leger, head of Coronation's Africa Investments. Are you going to share some of your secrets with us today, Peter? Um, well, with, with absolute pleasure. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not sure how, how secret they are, but uh, I'm very happy to uh, talk about what we're doing. All right, so, so you're performing very well and obviously recognition coming uh, fast and furious on your Africa foray. What is the key to, to an Africa fund right now or specifically to Coronation's Africa play? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could say that we'd um, discovered the Holy Grail and, and we'd uh, sort of figured it all out. Um, I think what's what's worked well for us though is just you know, managing risk and and where we find good companies taking large positions and, and being quite bold um, in backing the companies that we think are high quality and align themselves in terms of how we value companies. So that's worked very well for us. Where we wherever we've been uncertain and we've never been able to have high conviction in terms of valuation or the quality of the business, we've equally not been afraid to to stay away and. Fortunately, through that, I think we've managed to avoid some significant landmines and on the, on the flip side have, have done very well out of um, a number of stocks. Peter, I just wanted to ask you, it, it seems that Coronation's won every award uh, possible this year and uh, obviously a testament to the great investment uh, performance that, that you and, and the other members of the team have been doing. What do you think has been giving uh, Coronation the edge in terms of managing not only the portfolios in Africa but portfolios across uh, uh, South Africa and, and your emerging markets uh, offerings. Uh, is there a particular b recipe or, or secret that you think um, in some way is giving you a competitive edge over your peers? Well, look, I think it's I mean, a combination of things. Um, I think what has happened recently is if you look at the market in general, where, where high quality or, or stocks that are supported, their earnings are supported with good cash flows, um, consistent cash flows and very, very steady and predictable earnings, they've, they've all tended to do quite well. Uh, and, and those are the kind of businesses typically that reflect well in terms of our valuation process. So we, we do have a, uh, we tend to have a higher weighting in where we see quality supported by, by value. And, and I think that has worked recently. But I think overall, as a general coronation comment, um, you know, we've been fortunate that the team's been incredibly steady. We've, we've had a um, a very sort of low turnover number in the team which has helped and, and I think you know all of those things have pulled together to allow for for good performance to come through in the portfolios um, and Joe yeah, I mean I, th I think you, you, you get purple patches which which these certainly are this, this certainly has been one um, but I you know I think we we're mindful that you, you you certainly don't want to take it for granted and, and, and just extrapolate this going forward how do you dice up the, the African continent? Uh, certainly from a CNBC Africa perspective, we've got a presence in 10 countries on the continent and broadcast to 48, but what we're finding is that we've got a strong East African hub and a strong West African hub, and that we offer, a, we, we basically service the peripherals from both of those hubs. Uh, do you do the same? Well, we, we run everything out of Cape Town. Um, we do have satellite offices in Botswana and Namibia who look at those markets specifically but all the country analysis we, we do out of Cape Town. Um, but you're quite right that if you look at companies across the continent, you know, ca companies that have done very well in West Africa, very few of them have been successful in, in porting across to, to East Africa. And, and the cultural business climate seems to be quite different and the approach seems to be quite different. There are multinationals who certainly have been very successful at um, operating in different countries, but you know, banks, for instance, you can see how how difficult the fortunes are depending where they operate and, and, and that, they haven't been as successful. Um, what we try and avoid though is sort of spending too much time on the country specific aspect to, to the investment. Um, we find that there's generally a generic profile of business that you know when we find that in, in, in terms of how we value businesses when you know if we can tick all the boxes that we like um, it tends to be successful across geographies and, and it's worked well for us. 
Peter, I think what you've said is uh, I interviewed Gavin Jaber, who runs your Emerging Markets uh, Fund a little bit earlier this week, and he, he said that that on-the-ground perspective is very important in forming opinions around uh, the environment that businesses operate in. But from what I'm getting from you is a little bit different. Uh, do you spend a lot of time visiting the countries uh, that the companies operate in and visiting the companies themselves? Uh, and how much of a, an influence does that play in your investment decision? No, so I mean, I mean, maybe I misrepresented myself there a little bit, but definitely on the ground contact with, with companies and the operating environment is, is critical. So you want to have a sense of the challenges that, that companies are experiencing. So if we're looking at brewers, you want to have a sense of how they distribute, how big the, the formal market is that they can sell through, how big the informal market is. All of those elements are, are, are critical to understand your, the business that you're looking at and, and, and valuation. The, Day-to-day -day noise and sort of chatter that you get on the ground if you're in a, you know, if, let's say you, if you were taking broker phone calls all the time, that, that's a lot less relevant to us in terms of short-term um, business activity. But the longer-term themes, the regulatory environment, um, you know, how you control your inputs, you know, all of those things are, are very important. And you do only get a good feel for those by spending time in country. Um, I mean, there's nothing like you know, getting stuck at an airport or getting bounced out of your hotel room or having power go off or a four-hour traffic jam to give you a sense of the challenges that, that companies might have to deal with, and, and, and that's invaluable. I can add to that anecdote, having been in Nairobi recently, uh, when the president is out and about, everything comes to a standstill to make sure that the roads are clear for him to navigate to his next meeting. Anyway, coming back to the, the Africa play, we know that particularly East Africa, Peter was hard hit by the global crisis. And it's taken Kenya specifically a long time to, to gain traction. And it looks as though it is now back in, in full recovery mode and perhaps even leaning to some better momentum going forward. But there's the, the overriding risk that we could still see the global, uh, the global financial crisis too or whatever is on the horizon impacting the African continent again. Do you see that as an overriding risk? I think I see, we see it as a risk. Not as an overriding risk. All the geographies that we're looking at, all the countries, the the level of activity and, 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 and how dynamic they are. Um, you just have to you have to watch your show, you know, or just read the papers generally, and, and they're full of surprises and things move very quickly. I mean, Egypt was a uh, another case in point where I think very very few people saw it coming, and it was quite a, a surprise in terms of how how it all played out um, over the period of time that it did. But having said that. Um, if you look through that and you take a longer view and you invest in companies that are good companies that are well managed, they tend to have a self-correcting sort of mechaniz mechanism built into them and they actually ride through that kind of activity very, very well. Um, for us what happened in Kenya was, in, was, a, was a great opportunity to buy a number of the, the better quality businesses that we see there because you know, those are liquidity events where you, you have an opportunity of getting big, big lines of stock which often you, you, you don't see. Um, so when they do come, I mean, we, we don't feel that those are events that are going to dominate in the long term. They obviously a concern in the short term and, and, and in Kenya particularly when you saw the currency blow out and you saw interest rates move the way they did, they can be quite damaging for businesses. Um, but if you value through that and you take a longer view, um, we, we often see those as opportunities. Peter, just in terms of that, you, you mentioned the uh, what happened with the uh, the not the crisis in Egypt, but the I guess the Arab Spring, as they called it. Uh, yes. Were you guys brave enough at that time to go into Egypt and buy some of the companies there, or how do you manage uh, an event like that when it has such a dramatic effect on the value, valuations of, of the companies in that country? I mean, I'd, I'd love to say that we went into it owning very little of Egypt so we could uh, take huge advantage of it. That wasn't the case. We were already quite exposed to, to Egypt. And there are a number of companies there that we, that we really like um, and we think are, are, are superbly managed and, and are very cheap. Um, what we did do, though, is we used the opportunity to reposition ourselves quite dramatically um, within Egypt because certain stocks did really badly and, and presented a, a, a good opportunity. So overall, we didn't lose much going through, through the, the Arab Spring. And, and this year, in fact, um, Egypt has contributed very, very nicely to the overall portfolio performance. So it has, has overall worked out very well for us. 
And then just touching on Nigeria, we know that the, the cleanup in the banking arena spearheaded by Lamido Sanusi uh, has taken effect and, and it looks as though it is now far reaching, having an impact on the broader economy. You think Nigeria is going to go from strength to strength? Of course, everybody is talking about the Nigerian opportunity given the 60 million consumers in that territory. 160 sure. million, 160 million Correct. consumers in that territory. Correct. <laughs> A hundred million here and there. I won't, I won't hold against you. The, um, I mean, I think Nigeria, we, we're very large in Nigeria. It's a third of our, our portfolio. So, yes, I mean, we're very positive on Nigeria. We're a little different to many of the other Africa funds in terms of our, the competitors out there where we haven't gone nearly as big into the banks. And, and, we've, and that's since the beginning of the fund. We took advantage when, when we saw the crisis to, and they sold off um, to the extent that they did. Um, but we're a little more conservative when it comes to the second tier and the third tier banks in Nigeria. Um, it's, we just find it incredibly difficult to get a clear, a very clear view of, of the books. And you're right in terms of a lot of the work that's been done there. It, uh, I think it's given investors a lot more confidence and, and peace of mind uh, in terms of being able to access banks there. But there are still a number of unresolved issues which we think are concerning. Where we've taken very large positions are in the brewers and the consumer facing stock, excuse me, um, in Nigeria. And that, you know, if you look at something like a Nigerian breweries where it's grown volumes at 10% a year for the last 11 years, there are very, very few companies in the world that you can buy with growth dynamics like that um, and, and they're very profitable um, it's very profitable volume growth that, that Nigerian breweries has it's the fourth most profitable brewer in, in, in the world in terms of profit per hectolitre so some amazing companies that are doing great things in, in, in quite difficult environments um, but yeah you know we we certainly think the the medium to long-term picture for Nigeria is, a, is an excellent one um, and we, we expect to do quite well out of that.